So Kinan Rahmani uh, is an advisor to the White Helmets, um, the Syria defense, um, civil defense. And also, this is part of your work for the Syria campaign, which supports civil society. You're based in Washington, D.C. But tell, tell, tell us a little bit about uh, who you are, Syrian by origin, but now in America, and what your work is for Syria. Thank you so much for having me here, and yeah, really honored to be speaking about the White Helmets, who I've been working with now for over three years. I'm an attorney. Uh, Finished. There aren't enough of those in Washington. <laughs> Finished law school a couple of years ago and uh, continued working because I felt this was very uh, important that the world knows that there are people in Syria, as you saw in the video, who are being bombed every day by their own government, by the Russian government, and there are heroes that are ordinary, ordinary people. You know, these are school teachers and tailors and bakers who have decided they want to stay. They don't want to become refugees and go away. They want to stay behind and try to save the people who are stuck underneath the rubble. And the video is now uh, a little bit outdated. That's two years ago we made the video. Uh, today, the White Helmets have saved 115,000 people in Syria. Thank you. And the situation in Syria has also changed. The situation on the ground has changed, and therefore the work of the White Helmets has evolved. How, how, is, how are things different now compared with, for example, when that video was made? Well, a couple of years ago, the uh, intensity of the violence was much higher. The, uh, if you remember two years ago, almost exactly, there was the big campaign for the Assad regime to retake the city of Aleppo. Uh, it was considered one of the most egregious human right, or war crimes of this conflict. The Russian uh, Air Force helped basically to demolish half of that city in order to uh, retake that city, and tens of thousands of people were displaced into other parts of the country, tens of thousands became refugees as a result of that single campaign. I remember during uh, the last few months of 2016, 100 people were being killed every single day in Aleppo. Imagine every single day 100 people being killed in your city. Today that number has gone down dramatically because the amount of territory that's no longer in the control of the Assad regime has re been reduced significantly. And so the White Helmets have gone from doing dozens of rescue operations every day to now using the same equipment they used to use to lift up collapsed buildings. Now they're using that equipment to rebuild buildings, to help remove the rubble from areas that have been destroyed. And that geographically their, their area of operation has changed, has it not, because of the way that the Assad regime has, has retaken control of great swathes of the country. Yeah, so the, the White Helmets would like to be able to work everywhere in the country and to be able to support Syrian civilians no matter where they live. But the Assad regime considers these unarmed, impartial humanitarian responders to be terrorists and has even accused them of you know, being responsible for chemical attacks and all sorts of other accusations that are completely unfounded. The UN has disproven it. But... This is the, the narrative of the regime, and so now the White Helmets are no longer able to operate in Aleppo city. They're no longer able to operate in the suburbs of Damascus or in southern Syria. So where do areas. they operate? They operate now in, a, in one part of the country in the northwest called Idlib and some of the surrounding areas. There is roughly three million civilians that still live in this area, and of those three million, half of them were displaced from other parts of the country and moved into Idlib. Wow. So, uh, and, and the nature of their work in, in Idlib is, this, is still this reconstruction work, is it, rather than bombing? Well, there, you know, when there are bombings, they still respond to the bombings. Um, as we were talking about earlier, there's 
there was an agreement reached in the middle of October between Turkey and Russia to create a buffer zone around this last part of uh, opposition-held yes, territory. because before that, people were really concerned about an impending humanitarian disaster in Idlib. Um, millions of people who potentially were, whose lives were at risk. But is that still a threat? It is a threat because, first of all, every single ceasefire agreement that's been reached since 2011 has been broken by the Syrian government and Russia. There was a ceasefire agreement for the suburbs of Damascus. The regime re retook those earlier this year. There's multiple ceasefire agreements for Aleppo, ceasefire agreements in the south. Every time there's a ceasefire agreement, the Russian and Assad tactic is to use those ceasefire agreements just to defer military campaigns and to focus on other parts of the country. The problem now is that there's only one part of the country left and so if the regime were to take that part of the country, those people have nowhere left to go. In every other battle, in every other ceasefire, every time the ceasefire is broken, people were pushed into Idlib. But now that's the last place, and that's why it's so important that this holds. And just last weekend, there, were ren there was renewed Russian and uh, Syrian government military shelling on the uh, these periphery of Idlib. So we're very frightened that this ceasefire will not hold past the end of the year. Now, just last Friday, I believe it was, um, a, a good friend of yours was assassinated. It's been uh, in the news, a lot of uh, focus on this. Tell us who he was, what he did, and why he might have been killed. So this was not a white helmet. There have been yeah. plenty of white helmets killed, uh, over 200 258 white helmets have been killed in this conflict, most of them by double tap. Uh, you know, basically the Assad regime goes and bombs the same place twice in order to kill the humanitarian workers. But this guy was not a white helmet. His name was Raed Ferris, and he was a uh, protest leader. He was iconic in the early days of the Syrian uprising for his witty, humorous banners and cartoons that came out of uh, a small town in Syria that no one had heard of before called Kaframbil. It's a town of 30,000 people. I mean, it's a very small city. And he had a radio station? And yeah, he, so, so he, he had these protests and later on he made a radio station. He developed women's centers and children's centers. He developed programs to train journalists, to train uh, media activists. And he was um, against the Assad regime and then you know, as soon as ISIS came out, he was against ISIS and Al Qaeda, and he really, you know, he was the epitome of what Syrians wanted. Syrians wanted democracy; they wanted freedom and human rights, and they they refused both of the options that were forced on them. They refused Assad regime uh, tyranny, and they refused ISIS and the Islamic. And very quickly, extremism. I don't want to go into gory details, but sure. what happened to him? On he was assassinated last Friday, we believe, by uh, an offshoot of Al Qaeda. Yeah. So, uh, wh why do you think they were so keen to remove him? Well, the, the Assad regime and the extremists share that they both hate democracy. And Raed Faris was a, the biggest proponent of democracy you could ever have, and he used nonviolent means, humor, and, and you know understanding the world to try to bring that democracy to Syria and, and they, they found that unacceptable and so they killed him. Let's, uh, let's take a question or two from, uh, from the room. Who would like to ask a question of Kinan? Any questions? There's one back yeah. there. Could you say briefly who you are and then Sure, I'm um, Michael with the Economist Intelligence Unit. Um, thank you for sharing your story. I'm, I'm curious though, how do you maintain hope amid this situation? It doesn't seem like there's been a reckoning and it doesn't seem like, you know, with the way things are going that there will be a reckoning. I mean, how do you, you know, continue forward um, in the face of essentially, you know, a de continually deteriorating situation? Well, for me, as long as I see people like the White Helmets, as long as I see people like Raed Ferris risking their lives every day to try to make their country a better place, um, I think that's, that's reason for me to have hope. It's true the international community has failed 
horribly in dealing with this, uh, but there are brave heroes on the ground, and I think that gives me hope. Uh, I suppose it, 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 we're sitting here in, in Hong Kong. You were talking about democracy a little bit earlier. Why should people in this room care? I mean, it's a long way away. Um, people are very focused here, for example, on what's happening in China and uh, focusing on things like trade wars. Why is a war in Syria something that people here, apart from general shared humanity, is there a, a, a reason why people ought to be engaged in this? Well, all of, all of these conflicts are interrelated. When journalists like Raed Faris are killed in Syria, then other journalists could be killed in a Saudi consulate in Turkey. When, when hospitals are being bombed by the Russian Air Force in Syria, then hospitals can be bombed with impunity in other places. Once we allow these international norms to deteriorate in one part of the world, then we are no longer able to uphold them anywhere else. And that's why we, we, we need to, as people around the world, regardless of what kind of government we live under, to stand up with these people who are facing these devastating war crimes. I want to ask you finally about the, um, the Trump administration, this uh, policy that has, uh, the Trump administration has had towards the Middle East. Uh, how do you think that is influencing what is happening on the ground? Well, you know, there's a number of things. First of all, th this administration has further deprioritized human rights and democracy. And, it, and it's unfortunate because actually the Obama administration had already reduced the amount of funding that goes to support civil society in the Middle East. The Trump administration has reduced it even further. What about the White Helmets? So they, their funding is... The White simple. Helmets uh, did have uh, their funding stopped earlier this year for about a month. And then there was an uproar in Congress, in the media, and the funding came back. Because part of their funding comes from the government, but they get others through donations, or how does that work? So they have um, a, a number of sources, not just the US, the UK contributes, several other governments contribute, but there's also a private, uh, you know, many companies, many uh, individual foundations that support the White Helmets. Okay. And so we, we were able to manage the short crisis, and uh, now the funding has been restored. And sorry, I interrupted your thoughts on the, on the, 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 the withdrawal generally from support that the US yeah, administration has The had. withdrawal has further cemented the idea that civil society is less important, that we're going to deal with these authoritarian regimes. And the message that that sends is exactly the message that empowers groups like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda. It's exactly the message that causes people to become refugees and want to go to other places around the world. If we want to have stability in the Middle East, we have to support the civil society that's working there for democracy and human rights. Final, final question. Your prediction or predictions for 2019? I predict that the Assad regime and the, its allies, the Russians and the Iranian militias, will continue to wage a brutal military campaign against the Syrian people until they retake as much of the territory as they can. And the international community will be faced with a very difficult choice that now that the regime has retaken all of this, how can they create a situation which will be safe for refugees to come back? This is the same regime that bombed their homes, that arrested their brothers and sisters. How will refugees come back? And I think everyone wants to get rid of their refugees, but no one is willing to deal with the hard truths, is, which is that this regime is uh, incapable of responsibly protecting its own citizens. Kinan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And as I said, after, after uh, the meal, after the session, we'll be uh, returning uh, to the, white hel the theme of the white, white helmets. But now, uh, I'd like to hand over to my colleague from London, Anne McElvoy, who's going to uh, uh, moderate the next session, Anne, senior editor at The Economist and head of Economist Radio. Many of you who listen to the BBC regularly will be very familiar with, with Anne, so this is your chance to see her in person, not just as a voice. Okay.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed very nice to look into a room of people and, and hope that if you're not our listeners on Economist Radio, well, you might be uh, after tonight if we get it right. Um, I also am very fortunate in being able to have two great advocates of democracy and the rule of law here in Hong Kong about to join me. Their names will be very familiar to you over many years. They're Martin Lee, uh, founding chairman of the Democratic Party of Hong Kong, and Nathan Law, former chairman of Democisto, but also looking into 2019, trying to, to work out where this campaign for democracy and law goes in Hong Kong as we look forward. So I'm going to uh, welcome them to the stage in just a moment, and I think we're just going to rebuild. I've got, I've got a horrible microphone, thank you. I've got a nice microphone. This is what a broadcaster likes. Yes, a nice microphone and a glass of wine afterwards does it. Um, our guests are just going to come up and, and join me in a moment. And uh, of course, as with Daniel's session that you've just heard, we like to hear from you as well. You're very knowledgeable in the room uh, about Hong Kong, so please store up some questions. But welcome to the stage, Martin and Nathan. <laughs> Two very different generations here. I leave three. you to guess which. <laughs> Martin says three generations. Um, I've still got a little bit of feedback on my microphone. Here comes the third microphone. It's a very innovative place. Thank you. That seems to be a lot better. Thank you very much. Um, we're taking the temperature at the. We're taking the temperature as we look ahead in, into 2019. I'm going to. Ah, oh, you've done this before, right? <laughs> that is a very good point. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, okay, that's that, no, all right. I, I will let my guests start to talk and I will quickly switch everything off. Everything on my entire person. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm going to start with Martin and, and ask you, sorry, I think let's just get rid of this. As you say, the laptop is obviously the, is cursed. What we could do is just get rid of it. Someone just take it away. Just say, throw it away. Right. <laughs> right. So, um, Martin, uh, you know it wasn't the best. <laughs> is it just me? It was, you know, how good was it for Daniel? I mean, <laughs> um, you know, now I just have this great sense of superiority because it wasn't me. Uh, I think we just have to carry on and any, any help you could give us at the back would be great. So, I mean, Martin, talk to us a little bit about, first, about the rule of law being absolutely critical in uh, where we are. Um, it's been a difficult year in, in many ways. We're looking into a year we've seen a bit of a tightening for, from Beijing in many ways. Where does that leave... Hong Kong and its legal status, as someone who's been involved in that since 1997. Just before I sat down for dinner, a gentleman came up to me and reminded me that um, I gave a speech at Georgetown University in 1987. And he produced the script of my speech. It was yellow in color, and he asked me to autograph it. I took a quick look at the last page of that speech of mine, delivered in 1987, and I said, I certainly hope that the basic law will make sure that any interpretation of the basic law by Beijing will not have retrospective effect. It's interesting because I was just doing a case today where Beijing actually interpreted an article of the basic law and the result was that six legislators, including Nathan here, who took their oath of allegiance to Hong Kong after they won the elections in, 19, uh, in 2016, were disqualified as a result of their taking of the oath because of a subsequent interpretation of the basic law. In other words, when they took the oath, the president said it was okay, so they became legislators. But after that, Beijing interpreted an article of the basic law, 
to say their oath of office was invalid and therefore they lost their seats. So where does it leave us? We have the common law. And the common law says that if you do something today which is not unlawful, you cannot be punished for it if tomorrow they change the law. Because your conduct must be judged. At I'm just state. going to press you on that because our time is, is, is short to talk to you both. It, you could say, well, if Beijing takes a different view of what the law is as it applies to things like who can stand in elections, there is clearly a political background to this as well as a technical one. What is the strongest argument that you can then make for keeping that commitment to the Hong Kong legal system intact? Well, I don't mind if the law is changed so people know about it. But before the law is changed, you cannot punish people for it. And you think that, that view might prevail? That, well, that, that's already done by Beijing. And you're, you're with the Court of Appeal at the moment. The legislators are already disqualified. So it's like standing the common law on its head. Let's talk about uh, where this leaves the, the democracy movement more broadly. And Nathan, obviously, you were there in the umbrella protest, even younger than you are, you are now. Um, it, it, the last elections, the recent sort of by-elections, were not such a great success for the opposition party. What is, is going on there, and is there anything that needs to change on the opposition side? Well, of course, uh, for the democratic camp, we've been um, facing a lot of challenges and a lot of different opinion, opinion inside the camp. So I think we're better to look at how we could like, um, get everybody together instead of just pointing fingers to each other. And I think the role of the democratic camp will be much more important than the previous two years in the international stage because I think a lot of, you, a lot of the audience have read the report of USCC and uh, we could see that under the background of the trade war between China and US, uh, uh, Hong Kong, the, the, especially the autonomy of Hong Kong, will be a, a focus point of the international community. And I think the local uh, business community is also very concerned about it because as, if uh, the Hong Kong is not being seen as the in, uh, separated custom area, then, well, according to the Liberal Party's chair, uh, Felix, or he says that it will be a end game of Hong Kong. So I think it will be very important. And if I were to put to you the, the view that sometimes it, you hear in the business community uh, that the umbrella protests and everything it stood for, very brave, incredibly committed young people, but in the end, the solution is made in, in Beijing, not Hong Kong, and that business is going to happen anyway. This is a great business center. We can see all the big infrastructure uh, you know, developments to keep that in place. What case would you make for why you need to keep the democracy movement moving forward? Well, I think it's about the autonomy of Hong Kong. Well, once upon a time, there was a government officials telling me that uh, they wanted Hong Kong to copy the style of Singapore. Even though it is not by the people, they can be of the people and for the people. But the truth is, if you don't have autonomy, then you couldn't achieve that because you are not acting in accordance to the will of your people, but the will of uh, your boss, which is PRC. So I think for Hong Kong now, we are not of the people and by, by, by the people and for the people. We are by the PRC, of the PRC and for the PRC. So it is very difficult if we lose the autonomy and uh, we continue to thrive in terms of economy. Martin, that line by the PRC, of the PRC, you for a long time, and since 97 and your involvement in the drafting of that agreement on basic law, have argued that the solution lies in, with Beijing, not in separation or pursuing independence. Is there a, now a point where you think this is getting very difficult, particularly given the tightening that we've seen under Xi Jinping? Well, I, I certainly hope that he will see the way forward for Hong Kong. It's not like this because they are now squeezing Hong Kong, trying to control Hong Kong in every possible way. Indeed, in 2014, they published a white paper saying that the central government has comprehensive jurisdiction over Hong Kong, whereas we were promised by Deng Xiaoping that we have a high degree of autonomy. So how do the two sit together? And that's a worrying thing. 
And when you say it's the worrying thing, how would you imagine that the society, the broader society, whether it's business, democracy movements, or simply civilians who have an interest in, in, in how this all works, what should they press for in concrete terms? What would you say to Beijing, you need to do this because there is a downside for you if you don't, because they're not going to do it to be nice to, to the umbrella movement. Well, they certainly want Hong Kong to contribute um, under the One Belt, One Road uh, program for China. And um, Hong Kong is the only city in the whole of China which has the rule of law continue for long. And how can we help China then? We should talk briefly about freedom of the press. I think most people are aware of the case of Victor Mallet from the Financial uh, Times, who's had uh, his press visa revoked. This is obviously a, a, a new stage, uh, Nathan. I mean, what, what do you make of the background to this, just briefly? And also, what is, again, I'm always interested if we look ahead, what are the pressure points, realistically, apart from complaining that organizations like the Economist do stand for liberal, democratic, but also very open traditions, what is, what's the right thing to ask for? Well, definitely press freedom is a crucial for a liberal society. And definitely it is another case that um, re really signifying the, the autonomy of Hong Kong is in a very um, fragile spot because I don't think any of, of what any of us believe that, that is, the decision is made by the Hong Kong government. It's definitely not. And I don't think Carrie Lam is as stupid as it is. So, uh, well, well, to be very honest, if uh, we are talking about real politics, then the autonomy of Hong Kong may be tightly connected to the business environment of Hong Kong because of how um, US positioned Hong Kong. Well, definitely the, the unique separated uh, custom areas, the, the status is majorly contributed by the uh, uh, Hong Kong Policy Act, which operated by the US uh, co Congress. If um, the Congress thinks that the autonomy of Hong Kong is no longer existing, they could really revolt this act and, and make Hong Kong to, to be seen as the same custom areas as China, then it will be detrimental for our business area. Uh, and Martin, are you seeing it the same way as Nathan, or slightly differently, that this freedom of the press, we often, strangely enough, as journalists decide that we put it very uh, high up our, our pecking order of concerns, the, the Victor Mallet case and what it suggests, what, what does that say to you about where Hong Kong is at the moment with China? Well, press freedom is the most important freedom, because without press freedom, no other freedom is safe. Uh, but I, I can tell you a little story. Recent, uh, recently, everybody heard about the FCC, Foreign Correspondents Club. Now, some years ago, they actually invited Lee Kuan Yew to go there to talk about press freedom. Uh, but because he had a minor uh, operation, he couldn't come. So I was asked to deliver a speech at the FCC. And I said, uh, I could perfectly understand why Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was invited to talk about press freedom because he loves press freedom. So everybody looked at me, and I said, yes, Mr. Lee loves to press freedom. <laughs> very, very, very good, and not quite true, too. Let's look to the audience. Um, I'm sure we've got some questions here. Let's take some, some quick questions, if we could. Um, have we got a hand? And if you can wave as well, that would help your very long-sighted presenter. Um, who has a question for us? No question. Then we no, I was going to say, yes, there's a gentleman over here. And questions always come in the very last, I know from radio, the last minute on air. So rather than leave it for last minute, do it soon. Thank you. I'd be interested to hear from uh, both the speakers on the panel uh, what you think success looks like in uh, the next 20 years for Hong Kong. Sorry? What does success look like in the next 20 years for Hong Kong? Thank you, sir. Uh, Nathan? Well, the success definitely will have a government that uh, respects the two, two systems in, instead of just like, well, uh, protecting the one country because the, the, the beauty of one country, two system is that we, we can get a balance on that. If you are overwhelmingly supporting the one country and being detrimental to our two system, that's not how the government acts. So I think... In the future, if we've got democracy, we've got checks and balances, that will be the perfect form of government. Martin. Yes, because without democracy, we just cannot be masters of our own house. At, at least 
the government of Hong Kong should be left alone, but Beijing doesn't even trust the Hong Kong government. There's a problem. And they must learn that without Beijing trusting Hong Kong, this one country, two systems is bound to fail. And that cannot be good for Hong Kong or good for China. And if I were to say, and either of you take, take this, this one on, the view from Beijing may be, well, we're prepared to, to take the hit from some things not being as they were in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. that the sense of Hong Kong being part of China matters more to us. Do you not think that that is a realistic challenge both to, to, to you both, both politically and legally in Hong Kong? Yes, but um, when Deng Xiaoping came up with this idea of one country, two systems, that was not only for Hong Kong or even for Taiwan. That was for the whole of China. So that Hong Kong should be an example for China. Hong Kong capital, practicing capitalism and very successfully. And I think Deng Xiaoping wanted Hong Kong to lead China forward. Well, I think that is, uh, well, I think every one of you could contribute to, to this a little bit because for now we could see that the, the deterioration of autonomy of Hong Kong would definitely pose a threat of our business environment. Then you could really voice out to say that we are here to protect our business interests so that we better keep our autonomy. To be fair to say, democracy movements really discovered business here as, a, as a, an extra lever, briefly. You discover using business and business interests as a bit more of a lever for what you want to achieve as well, you look to 2019. Well, definitely we have to unite every single person in Hong Kong. And uh, we, we could see that a lot of people are really aware of how the business community goes. Another question. Um, I have a question for Martin Lee. How do you, what's the best way to ask for more democracy? from someone who doesn't believe in democracy. <laughs> Martin, take it away. A friend of mine said to me, Martin, how can you ask Beijing to give you democracy? Even if they want to give it to you, they don't have it. But I think China should also go down the democratic way. And I, I'm sure the whole world would love to deal with a China which is democratically elected. And where better for China to begin with democracy than in Hong Kong? Because it was already promised to us. So I hope the international community would see it that way and support Hong Kong and talk to the Beijing leaders that that is the way forward. 30 years as we come into 2019 since Tiananmen, I, let me play the voice of Beijing here and say that's exactly what I'm worried about, what Martin has just laid out. What would be the, the best uh, answer to the gentleman's question? Well, I think we are not begging for democracy. We are fighting for democracy. And it's always been a difficult role for, well, for any countries, any regions that have been through that particular fight. So I think for now, for Hong Kong people, we definitely have to hang on and state that we indeed support for democracy and we fight for it. Another question, if we could last one, just to, to use our time. I think I, there's a lady over there in a white jacket. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm Laurel West from The Economist Group. To be perfectly transparent, I have a question for Nathan. Uh, the streets have been a bit quiet of late, uh, despite several uh, things that have happened that might have normally brought people out. What do you think um, is going to happen in the future with regard to mass protests in Hong Kong? Very pleased you asked. Thank you. Uh, yes, the, the role of street protests, have we seen the well, end of that? I, I do agree that the, the social movement has been a little bit cooled down uh, recently, and I, I believe that that's because we, 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 are, we are all used to the government that played by the book, but for now they're destroying every rule that we have, so people are not very used to it. But I think, well, um, after a period of like accommodating the new situation, they, they, they will really uh, feel angry again and they do come out and I think that it's a matter of a period, matter of um, a period of getting used to it. Uh, Martin, how much do we really know about what the general population then makes of this? I've heard over years of coming in and out, some people irritated by the disruption of street protests and others perhaps quietly supportive but not wanting to say anything. Has the mood changed? I mean you've had a good number of decades watching this process here in Hong Kong. What, what, what's your honest opinion now about that? I think Hong Kong people, in their hearts, 
love democracy. I'll give you proof. When Hong Kong people leave Hong Kong, emigrate from Hong Kong, where do they go? They, all, they only go to democratic, democratic countries. <laughs> so, but of course, many of them are not brave enough to speak up uh, for, for fear of offending Beijing. And that might affect the business. But even the business of Hong Kong now are waking up because of this uh, trade war between the US and China. And uh, it is possible for the US government to switch off the advantages given to Hong Kong under the US Policy Act. So long as the US president believes that Hong Kong is no longer having a high degree of autonomy, is no longer a different system, he can just pull the button. And you know the president of USA loves pressing buttons. <laughs> and, and then we'll be treated like any other Chinese city. So now the, even the Hong Kong businessmen are now waking up. Uh, I'm just uh, allowing myself one minute of extra time because we started a, a tad late, but just briefly if I could get from both of you your predictions for 2019. And I'm going to just squeeze a little bit out of you uh, something that should happen in Hong Kong and something that shouldn't. Nathan. Well, I, I believe that um, the trade war will heat up and Hong Kong will be uh, much, getting much more spotlight because of its unique status. And I think the people in Hong Kong, they will, um, well, they, they will be rejuvenized because, um, well, we, we could see that there's international support to Hong Kong's fight for democracy. So I, I believe that in 2019, there will be a, 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 boost, a boost for our movement. Anything needs to change on your side, on the opposition side? Well, definitely we have to keep reviewing ourselves. We have to get some support from the uh, different groups of people in Hong Kong. Martin, last word to you. I'm going to predict that Hong Kong will have democracy in, uh, in 2019, but with a, with a footnote. Last time I came here to predict something, I predicted that uh, in soccer, they will introduce the video-assisted referee and it took 12 years to materialize. <laughs> well, there you go. At least you've got a, d a date on it. And I was loosely calculating that by the time we get Nathan back to speak with as much life experience about Hong Kong as Martin would be into the 2070s, do come and join us. Thank you very much. Thanks to Martin. Thanks.